Downtown Business Partnership. Uh, this is something new for us, and we're very excited. First, I want to thank the candidates for showing up tonight, but also for, for being um, willing to take time out of your lives to do something that's very important. And we need people engaged uh, in our civic life. Uh, that's what our country is based on, and I really appreciate you doing this. Uh, the ground rules are fairly simple. <clears throat> All questions from the audience have to be written. Uh, no questions uh, will be from people asking aloud. Uh, if you give Eric your uh, questions uh, written on an index card, he will get them up to me, and we will put them in the pile. Uh, I received some questions ahead of time, uh, and we will do that. Each, each candidate will be given two minutes for an introduction so they can introduce themselves. Two minutes to answer a question that they got in advance, and then one minute to answer each audience question. That, after that time goes through, then they will be given two minutes for a closing statement. We went through and uh, drew names, and so we have an order, and then I will shuffle them around so everyone isn't, so the same person isn't first or last all through the thing. So we'll all get mixed up. So, Tim, your name is first, so if you could give us an opening statement. First, I'd like to thank the League of Women's Voters of the Bangor area, Hassan University, and the Bangor Downtown Partnership for sponsoring and hosting this important event. I also want to thank the audience here in person, those watching from home, and my friends and colleagues up here on the stage for your civic participation and interest in supporting Bangor's students and families. My name is Tim Surratt, and I'm excited to be running again to serve on the Bangor School Committee. I was first elected to this role in 2017 and again in 2020. These past six years, it's been an honor and privilege to work alongside various committee members, administrators, and faculty and staff to, to promote academic success and the social and emotional well-being of the 3,500 plus students we serve. I live in Bangor with my spouse, Lauren, who is a licensed child psychologist and professor of mental health, and our twin eight-year-olds who attend the Abraham Lincoln School. I've dedicated my professional career to the field of education and have a passion for public educational institutions, such as the Bangor School Department. I began my career as a middle school science teacher at the James F. Dowdy Middle School, and then went on to be an administrator at the Dr. Lewis S. Libby School in Milford. After completing my doctorate in education, I joined the faculty at the University of Maine at Augusta. I'm currently an associate professor of education on the Bangor campus of UMA, and have the privilege of working alongside my colleagues to prepare, to prepare future educators for the critical role they'll play in the lives of students throughout Maine and beyond. I'm also proud to currently serve on the Board of Directors for the Holocaust and Human Rights Center of Maine and the Boys and Girls Club of Bangor. In my closing statement, I'll outline a few priorities I would pursue during the next three years. Thank you again, and I look forward to the dialogue we'll have this evening. Shelley? I'm running for Bangor uh, School Committee because I believe in the power of community. I believe in the responsibility to serve. And I believe that a children's education is paramount. My name is Shelly O'Carey, as you said. And I have three kiddos in the Bangor School District. I have a fifth grader at Mary Snow, um, a son, a third grader at Fleet Street, and a pre k -er who just, just started pre k preschool this uh, past September, who's also at Fleet, uh, Fleet Street. Um, so I have a vested interest in the success of Bangor schools, uh, but I also have a passion for success of all students. Um, I've devoted my legal career to representing children. Um, as a legal aid attorney, I uh, help to remove barriers to children's education, um, housing, um, healthcare, as well as uh, education. Um, as a juvenile prosecutor, 
I uh, gave voice to victims of juvenile crimes, but I also um, understood the complex nature of uh, those crimes and often recommended diversion, um, health care, uh, mental health services, and um, substance abuse counseling. Um, I'm currently a member of the Bangor uh, School Committee's uh, Advisory Committee on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, where I work to um, give recommendations to increase uh, diversity in uh, retention and recruitment of staffing there. Um, but like I said, I also have uh, three children in the Bangor schools, and I also have compassion, reason, and accountability uh, that I bring to everything that I do. And I hope to bring that to the school committee. And I hope that I can have your vote um, on November 7th. Thank you. Applause is great, but let's hold it until the end of the forum. It's it, just to save time. Thank you very much. Uh, Katie? Hello, everyone. My name is Katie Bryden, and it is an honor to be here tonight and to be running for Bangor School Committee. Thank you to the League of Women Voters, to the Downtown Bangor Partnership, and to Hudson University for providing us this opportunity. I am really looking forward to talking with you tonight about all of the reasons why I am interested in serving on the Bangor School Committee. Um, there's a lot. But I think it's probably best to begin with the most personal, which is I truly believe, based on personal experience, that school is more than just a place you go to learn. School is where childhood happens. And growing up, I lived at school. My siblings joke there are no pictures of me growing up because I was always at the school. I went in early with my mother. She worked in the cafeteria. I stayed late. I joined every club, volunteered in the classroom, played sports I didn't have business playing, all because school was my safe place. School was a place that I felt loved, where I felt seen and valued, where I had attention, um, and where I learned my passion. And I had the great opportunity to attend a school that had so many more opportunities outside of the classroom to pour into their students so I could discover who I wanted to be. And I could meet people who inspired me, and I could learn more about myself. And that's why I'm here today, because of those other opportunities that came from school. And I have spent my career dedicated to creating inclusive schooling because that's what I believe, working for a nonprofit that creates social and inclusion programming for students with disabilities um, is critical for that inclusion piece. I have three kiddos in the Bangor School Department, um, and I choose to raise my kids here because I believe in the power of school, and more importantly, I believe in the power of Bangor. And I'm excited to tell you about it tonight. Is that good, Nancy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Sherry. Hello, thank you for coming. I'm Sherry Hunter. Okay, let's see. I grew up here in Bangor. I lived on the outer Union Street, actually where Paul Bunyan Campground is, but we did not have the campground when I lived there. Um, I have two boys, 21 and 16. When they were five years and five months, I became a single parent. Um, their father passed away, for, so for the last 16 years and counting, I'm still raising them. Um, I worked at Bangor Federal Credit Union for 27 years. I was in operations, and when you're in operations, you're into every department. You have to know all the new stuff coming in and getting people trained and everything with that. Um, they did give me a challenge one year to take over supplies. Yeah, sure. I'm a couponer and reward person. Sure, why not? That first year I saved them $20,000. Plus I end up getting a lot of free stuff with the rewards and then turned it over to raise money to help someone that is having a benefit dinner for someone that has cancer, etc. I love volunteer. I did leave work to be a stay-at-home mom. Well, you know, that gets boring after a while, especially with me. 
So, of course, I volunteer a lot in the community. I help with the children. I help with the elderly. Um, right now, I am part of Daughters of Isabella. If you don't know, it's kind of like the Knights of Columbus in the Catholic Church. It's the female version. Um, they asked me to come and join them a few years ago um, to help audit their books, which I did. And now I'm their treasurer. And so, um, so yeah, I have done a lot of volunteer here, and I get right out and talk to people. And if I don't know the answer, I find the answer. And I keep on plugging at it until people can get help. So, yes, I definitely will. And I see my time's up. So thank you for coming tonight. This was the question that we gave the candidates beforehand. Uh, the league felt that it seems as if public education uh, is being besieged, if you will. So the question is, why do you think public education is important? And Katie, could we start with you? Thank you for that question. I love it because Bangor, I'm public education, got Bangor on the mind, um, is important because it's the only equalizer we have in this nation. That's it. It is the one thing that we collectively as a society decide that this is important. We're going to pour into this no matter what. Everyone is able to come. We have laws and resources and supports because every child deserves access and access to public education is the most powerful thing we have in this country. I, like I said before, loved being at school and having the access to build my community and find myself um, and explore so many things outside of the classroom. And that's what public education provides. If knowledge is power, then public education ensures every child has the opportunity to take their power. And I truly believe that when a school has well-resourced and supported teachers, opportunities that extend beyond the textbook and act as a community hub where students feel like they belong and where teachers want to work and where family members want to visit and pour into, there is no limit to what a community can do. So pouring our energy and attention and love into public education is the best we can do not only for our kids but for our future as well. Thank you. <laughs> Katie. Oh, see, I didn't, you already did it. No, no, you can't do it again. I'm sorry. <laughs> Shall I? <sighs> I should go back to school. Um, for me, public education is so important, like I said in my opening. Um, from basic reading and uh, writing and math skills that are essential for daily life, uh, to the ability to think critically and analyze uh, tough questions like who to vote for in an election, um, to understanding the wider world um, with uh, curiosity and compassion. Um, I think public education is like the basis of our society. Um, but I stress public in that it needs to be accessible for all. Um, personally, I'm a child of immigrants. Uh, my parents immigrated um, here from Nigeria and they stressed the, the pathway to success was paved with public, by public education. And um, one of the drivers of public education are teachers. Now, uh, I was a painfully shy um, child growing up. And my fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Moore, I'll, I'll never forget her. Um, she was patient, she was kind, she was loving. She was supportive, and she genuinely cared about the success of all of her students. Um, she, she guided me, along with my parents, uh, to reach for the stars, to um, be successful, to step out of my comfort, comfort zone. And I'm forever grateful, grateful to, to her, Mrs. Moore, for that. Um, so I think public education is important because it provides students the opportunity to have their own Mrs. Moore. Thank you.
Sherry. You know, with that question, we're going to all kind of have the similarity, but I know the difference between public and private because I went to both. My children went to both, and I did volunteer at All Saints. Um, the difference definitely, <clears throat> if you have a child that has some learning disability, a lot of the private schools can't accommodate them. So that's why public school is important, because these children need that extra help. Um, if you're different, some private schools do not accept it, which is hard, because they're God's children, and that's what they teach us, right, in religion, God's children. But they don't accommodate on certain things, and public schools do. And yes, that's why it's very important for that. So yeah, I do know the difference. Um, you don't have to volunteer and do fundraising like the private schools require you to do as a parent because it's very hard, especially a working parent. Um, they require 20 hours. You don't think it's a lot, but it is. Um, I was just lucky to have seven weeks of vacation time where I worked so long that I got to spend a whole week there to kill those hours. So yeah, um, so there is big differences with private and public, but yeah, public gives you more opportunity. There's more clubs, there's more sports for the children. Thank you. Thank you. Instant? The Boston Latin School, the first school in America, was established on April 23rd, 1635, and this college preparatory school still exists today. For much of its first 225 years, its students were white, male, Protestant, and mostly from affluent families. Until the mid-1800s, these were the students who primarily had access to education in much of the United States. Nationwide, universal public K-12 education began in earnest in the mid-1800s under the leadership of Horace Mann, then Secretary of Education in Massachusetts. In 1838, he outlined six guiding principles for public schools. The public should no longer remain ignorant that such education should be paid for, controlled, and sustained by an interested public that this education will be best provided in schools that embrace children from a variety of backgrounds, that this education must be non-sectarian, that this education must be taught using the tenets of a free society, and that this education should be provided by well-trained professional teachers. I'd like to focus on principle number three, that this education will be best provided in schools that embrace children from a variety of backgrounds. I view this as the most compelling reason why public education is important, because it says loudly and clearly to families in Bangor and those who come here from around the world, your children are welcome at our school. Regardless of race, religion, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, economic status, disability status, and whether or not they speak English, all are welcome and all will receive academic preparation access to caring, competent educators, and most importantly, access to peers who are different from one another and where differences are respected, valued, and embraced. This is why public education is vitally important. Thank you. Okay, our first audience question, and Katie, we'll start with you. Will you push city council for more funding to ensure our teachers are paid fairly and also have everything they need for the students in their classroom? I'm sorry to make you walk. <laughs> People tell me they think of the answer as they come up. Thank you, Barbara. Um, yes, 
Yes, I will. I will push city council to do whatever is needed to ensure that our schools are well provided for. Um, I've knocked on a lot of doors uh, since pulling papers, um, both with people running for city council as well, and tax dollars always come up. Um, and as much as the tax burden is on the citizens of Bangor and as much as we're seeing it rise, not a single person has ever said to me, I want less to go to schools. People look at me and they're like, oh, I know that there's also, you know, um, I don't even have kids here, but I know the Bangor schools are incredible. I know that they are committed to academic excellence and, and they're going to be our future. So I want to invest in that. I am open to discussing ways that we can diversify funding, um, looking at new innovative strategies to bring in more money. Um, but ultimately, if we can work together with the city council to have those resources and supplies and supports available to adequately um, build our uh, teachers and their compensation and their support, then I will push for that. Thank you. Thank you, and yes, I would, and I, I did push for, for wages, higher wages for our educators in this past uh, budget negotiations with uh, City Council, and I, I will continue to do so. I, I firmly believe Bangor has some of the best educators in Maine, and I firmly believe what attracts them here is our excellent, rep our excellent reputation and also our very competitive wages. Um, so yes, I would continue to, um, to negotiate and, and push for high wages for our teachers. Thank you. Sherry? It's a big yes for me, yeah. definitely. Um, they do a lot with our students and teaching them, and we need to protect them. So yes, I would be asking for more funding to may update these schools for safety so they feel safe to teach. Um, the outside of schools, yes. Um, I had talked with a grandmother. She's been calling the city about a sidewalk. It's probably, what, 300 feet, give or take, but they're not fixing it. They're not doing anything. So these kids have to walk to Mary Snow in the road. She doesn't want them to get hit by a car or anything. She's been asking for the sidewalk. Why aren't they doing that? So I told them, well, you know, if I'm on the school board, then I can work something out with that because it's a child safety that I'm going to be pushing for. So yes, definitely I be work. I want to work with the city, and also I have other things that I want to work on to to help the parents that are working to um, do an after school program, and it be funded by the parents, of course, um, because that's just another extra. Uh, I mean, extra work for them. So um, I think we should be really concentrating on safety and these kids can be in a safe place after school for just a few hours. And that's all it is, three hours after school and we can do this. Thank you. Shelly? Do you need me to read the question over? Um, maybe for the audience if they've forgotten. Oh, sorry. No, that's all right. Um, will you push city council for more funding to ensure our teachers are paid fairly and also have everything they need for students in the classroom. Thank you um, for that question, um, for that softball question, because the answer is yes. Um, <laughs> um, totally, I, I completely support um, pushing city council, but also exploring um, different um, alternative funding streams, talking with the legislator, um, state, um, maybe in federal um, government to see if there's ways to um, increase uh, the funding in general to schools, but more specifically uh, to teachers. Um, this is an app question, being that today is World Teachers Day. Um, so I really appreciate that question. I think that um, teachers are extremely undervalued um, and um, underappreciated. So that's one of the, the missions that I have um, on the school committee is just to constantly think about the teachers. Often we think about the students, of course, it's obvious, um, but to also remember that um, the reason that the schools function is because of the teachers. Thanks. Shelly, if you want to stay here, oh, I'll, sure. I'll have you first for the next okay. one. Which is, what do you think that the Bangor schools are doing right? Um, 
I think, uh, the, thank, first of all, thank you for the question. Um, I'd say the list is long. Um, I love Bangor. Um, I've been living here for almost 10 years now, and one of the reasons that I enjoy Bangor is because of the schools. Um, they have, uh, my, like I said before, my children go to Mary Snow and Fruit Street, and they're such a welcoming environment, uh, so friendly and caring. Um, the principal at, Mary, uh, at Fruit Street and Mary Snow are like phenomenal, staff is great there. Um, communication, the PTO are very active. Um, but I wanna make sure that that's spread across the district. I'm not super familiar with every single school, but uh, talking to uh, constituents, I've heard that there's different issues at different schools, and I wanna make sure that, that um, the love and the caring that I feel at uh, Fruit Street and Mary Snow is um, um, consistent across the district. Thanks. Sherry? Okay, what they're doing right. Hiring the teachers, hiring counselors, hiring social workers to help with the students for our, their future. Um, loving the coaches, putting their foot down. No drugs or alcohol or you're out. Yes, we need that now more than ever, especially with Bangor, the way it's becoming. Um, so yes, I believe um, all of the people that interact with these children to make them be better and go for what they want in their life to be um, that person, I definitely believe they are doing a great job on doing that and helping these children to be, become who they want to be. Thank you. Thank you. Tim? Thanks for this question, and I want to agree with Sherry on, on one point she mentioned. I think Bangor is doing an excellent job really looking at student support services for its, for its students, so school social workers, school counselors, school psychologists. That's something I've been pushing for over the last, um, really last six years, and I, I think Bangor has done a, an excellent job. I think there's more work to be done there. Um, there's a mental health crisis among our students, particularly our, our teenagers. Uh, and I, I think it's an area we've, we've done well, but we can improve. Uh, the only other, the other one I wanted to mention was we have an amazing diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging committee, which I've been a part of um, for the last uh, year, doing some really cutting edge work on diversifying our staff and faculty and also uh, making improvements to our curriculum K-12. Thank you. Thank you, I love this question. I love its positive framework um, because Bangor's doing so much right. I think that their commitment to academic excellence is clear. Um, we have been able to see our Bangor students thrive and go on to do incredible things. I think that the tide is turning in leadership. I think that there is more transparency than there has ever been before. And I am looking forward to pouring into that and continuing that trend. And I think that Bangor has phenomenal staff, the type of staff that um, I want to do more to support because I know that they are there. Um, before school, after school, and pouring their personal attention and energies into. Um, and I just want to note that I love the new um, mental health facilities that Bangor High School has opened, and also um, that they're opening in the middle schools. I look forward to new opportunities to expand mental health and support even further. Thank you. Candidates, if I miss somebody, please <laughs> tell me. I didn't get my chance to answer, <laughs> but we'll try. This is the next question, and Tim, you'll be first. What do you think the school committee can do to ensure that all students feel safe and supported in school, regardless of their race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, or socioeconomic status? Thank you for this question, and, and a lot of that aligns with uh, the, the initiatives of the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Committee, um, which has been doing excellent work over the last couple of years. It's a, it's a group of educators, administrators, folks from various nonprofits in the community. Um, Shelley uh, serves on the, on the committee as well, as she mentioned. 
And we're really looking at that question and how can we be representative in our curriculum, in the texts we use, um, so that all students feel included, feel represented. Um, what kind of professional development and training are we giving to our students, uh, to our staff and to our faculty, and also students as well on um, these topics of making students feel welcome, feel safe, uh, regardless of, of their ethnicity, their race, their economic status, um, so on and so forth. So those are all things that, that we're working on and, and that I will continue to advocate for. Thank you. Um, I love this question too. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so to ensure that students feel safe and supported regardless of where they come from, their background, their race, their gender, um, like I said before, it is more than just what we are teaching in the classroom. I want to pour into an evaluation of our curricula. I want to look at the language that we're using to teach students about pronouns and history and um, evaluate the way that we are introducing new topics to our students. Um, but more than that, I want there to be extracurricular opportunities to change the culture of the school so that students go in and it's not just participating in a class, but it's also being able to see their culture represented in clubs and activities. I am the vice chair of the Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Human Rights Committee for the city of Bangor, and we have learned so much from our partners at the Wabanaki Youth and Culture Center. Um, and as soon as that opens its doors, I am thrilled to see the new opportunities that Bangor can connect to include new opportunities such as that um, in our schooling. Thank you. Thank you for this question. Um, this is a passion of mine, um, making uh, students and staff feel that they belong. I think it uh, starts with building a culture of belonging, and um, one way to, to do that is to make sure that uh, students and staff see themselves um, represented in the staff. Um, that's why I'm on the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, Belonging um, Subcommittee, and we um, focus on the retention and recruitment of those diverse staff. Um, it's hard to see to uh, be um, a minority student, uh, excuse me, myself and my children as an example, um, and you attend school and you don't see any teachers that look like you, you don't see any principals that look like you, uh, you begin to think, am I different? What's wrong with me? So I want to make sure that um, students feel uh, welcome. And another way to do that is uh, by accountability. It's nice for us to say that we'd like to increase um, the diversity of staff, but um, we have to start with how, what is diversity? Um, it includes not only race, gender, ethnicity, but social and economic status, um, um, sexual orientation. Um, it's very large. You want everyone to see themselves um, in, in, in the school. Um, but in order to do that, you have to understand uh, what, what diversity is, but then also how do you measure it um, in order to increase it? Because we can say we're increasing diversity, but are we actually increasing it if we're not measuring it? Um, but I see my time has lapsed, so I'll cut there. I can go on and on and on about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think too is what's important is teaching people that don't understand. I would like to see, um, I think it was Joe Baldacci that did international dinners which I thought was really nice, so people can talk and learn. And it would be nice to set up something that we do like one month and just keep changing it to different um, people's backgrounds. Um, learning their cultures, I think, would be very helpful for people that don't understand, because you do have families that are closed-minded. They're not open-minded. so. They're learning that from their family. It'd be nice to teach these students that are from those families to actually learn about what's happening nowadays with the students coming in from different places and, and you know, of course, different genders and stuff. And I'm trying myself to learn all the they, them, and stuff, if, you know, because I'm from growing up in the 80s. So, you know, I'm trying to learn myself too. But I think it would be good and helpful to bring that into the schools and be able to socialize, actually, and make it fun for people to learn. Thank you. Sherry, why don't you stay here and you'll be first for the next question. Oh, boys, okay. <laughs> Hang on, let me. 
Let me read a question here. Can you juxtapose, uh, can you put together the <laughs> need for access to the internet and media and the pressure to monitor the same for personal interest of students? Do you understand? There's, how do you put together, you know, kids need to learn how to use what's on the internet and how to use social media. But how do you balance that with them using it too much? So I think that's what you what the questioner meant. <laughs> right, right. I think I right. I think time limit, of course, you know, but that's going to be up to the parents um, to decide on how much time. Um, I know my boys and their friends; they're on it all the time too. So. I, I don't really, that would be up to a parent more than a school board. Um, that's a private thing at home and stuff, and I, I would leave that up to the parents to decide on that. Thank you. Shelly? Can you read your question? Okay. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah. I have to read the questions. I'm so sorry. Okay, I see. Um, I think the internet is um, an, an awesome, powerful tool. And to not utilize it would be a disservice to Bangor um, and the children within Bangor. Um, but agreeing with Sherry, that I think that um, there has to be limits. I think the, the school currently has um, uh, limits in place when you know, children are using the internet. Um, as far as you know, seeing inappropriate content or deviating to things that aren't um, um, education focused. Um, but I think that uh, internet is so, I mean, it's integral to our, our society, so we can't not use it. But I think as they get older, um, you open it larger and wider, teaching them about internet safety and um, the pros and cons of the internet and the, the information that it holds as well as the troubles or the pitfalls that it also holds. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thanks for this question. My current uh, profession is working with women and non-binary adults to learn technology in safe spaces. Um, again, love an inclusive classroom. Um, but I recognize that in the work that I do every day, technology is here to stay and it's only going to get more pervasive. And one of the students we work with, I think, said it best, which is um, we have to be the pilot and technology has to be our co-pilot. And the second we let technology be our pilot and we move over to the co-pilot seat, that's when the danger happens. If we can pour into our students to teach them safety, teach them how to navigate this, trust them with the critical thinking skills that they need to move past these barriers that are going to happen, um, then that's what we need to be doing in the school. At the same time, I recognize the responsibility of a school board is to create policy. So I would love to hear from other parents on how we can create a policy so that they can be involved in this decision making as well. Thank you. Thanks for this question. I, I think in terms of what schools can do, they can really look at opportunities for digital literacy, information literacy. I mean, the internet, we're, we're flooded with information. Some of that information is very good and some of that information is very bad and helping students to understand what that bad, false information is and what information out there is high quality is a really important skill. I mean, you can, you can go on to the, you could take an issue like the current Ukrainian Russian war and conflict and you can go on the internet and you can find very different narratives about that uh, conflict, very different facts and well facts as they're presented uh, about that issue and understanding how to um, question resource, question sources, 
find good sources of information, be critical in terms of what you're reading and the information you're getting from the internet, really important skills that I think schools have a, have a place in. Thanks. Thank you. Tim, this is so very heavy first for the next question. What do you see as the school committee's role in supporting teachers when they face false accusations, for example, grooming, and harassment from community members. Thank goodness I haven't heard of that happening in I hope it isn't happening in Bangor. But how can you help retain great teachers? Great question, and it's a simple answer. You have to defend them fiercely. And there's attacks out there on public education, and it's why we asked that really important question. And you mentioned that that was the reason why you asked that question. There are attacks on public education for a variety of reasons, mainly political reasons. And when teachers are swept up in this battle, school committees need to defend them fiercely. Thank you. Judy? Um, thank you very much. Um, as of the school committee, I think that it is our due diligence to evaluate all truth and to recognize that we have hired staff that we trust and that we want to be in the classroom every day and we need to put value in that we also need to understand that humans are fallible i think that this is a great opportunity for um, us to work with um, unions and other support organizations and people that are there to support the teachers and to make sure the teachers are safe so that we as a school committee can be as objective and clear and getting to the safety um, of our students as possible while also recognizing that our teachers are the school's greatest asset and investing in them um, is a valuable stake that step that we need to take um, as a school committee. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, as I alluded to several times, um, I think uh, teachers are undervalued, underpaid, um, underappreciated, and um, I commit to doing everything that I can to support teachers and make them feel that they're supported. Um, now, assuming that the allegations are invalid and baseless, which it sounds like that's what the question was suggesting, um, I would support the teachers. Um, I, like Katie said, um, that's why uh, unions are so important and useful um, in that they can be a voice for uh, the teachers in, in that scenario. But I think that I can speak for the, uh, more by myself, I'll speak, speak for myself and say that I would uh, completely support the teachers in that scenario. Thanks. Thank you. And Sherry? Yeah, if a teacher is falsely being accused, definitely investigation needs to be taken in place um, to have the school committee to be behind them. Um, if something is going on, definitely we need to know and take care of it right away. Um, as you know, I'm Catholic and yeah, we've had some bad monsters come into the priesthood, so yeah. So I know all about that part of it too. So um, we need to protect the children too, but there is some people that, some children, I hate to say it, but they, if they don't like the teacher, they will say some things that aren't true. So yeah, we have to, as a committee, to um, be behind the teacher after the investigation is over. Katie, uh, this may be our last question. We'll see how fast it goes. But we'll start with you. What was the most valuable thing you learned in your K through 12 education experience? And do you think it's being taught at the Bangor schools now? Take two minutes to respond. No, I'm just kidding. Um, the most valuable thing that I learned um, in my education is how to build community, how to make friends, how to trust others, how to work together. 
and I believe strongly that is being taught at the Bangor School Department. Um, I know that they are bringing in new uh, supports and resources. I know that the Bangor schools do everything they can to create a safe classroom for um, students with disabilities and to do additional education for students, um, multilingual learners, um, and no matter the color of your skin, your race, religion, um, being able to have a connection with the student that you're next to um, is the most important tool that's going to make you a successful adult because we're always gonna be working with new people and learning new things. Um, and I have dedicated my career to cultivating those inclusive opportunities and I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to continue to support our Bangor schools to bring in more of those opportunities. Um, thank you. Thank you for this question. I'm, on, I'm honestly going to go home and ponder this some more because I think it's an excellent question. Um, but on the top of my head, I think the thing that I learned, or most important, one of the most important things that I learned in school was um, critical reasoning skills, um, taking in information, um, processes it, processing it, um, analyzing it, uh, using um, a dash of compassion, and um, coming to a reasonable conclusion based off of those um, information that you gathered. Um, I apply it to everything that I do, um, from you know, teaching the kids how to button their, their, sh their coat to deciding on, you know, uh, again, who to pick for an election, which is a very important decision, um, to any, anything in, in between. Um, I think it's in, in one, the basis of, of education, really, um, understanding how to analyze something and to act um, on that and that um, um, that information and with a dash of compassion I would always say um, and I think that Bangor schools is, is teaching students that um, if it wasn't then I don't think I'd be happy with uh, the Bangor schools which I am thanks thanks for the question um, one of the most important things I learned from school from my school experience is that there were all of these um, adults that, that cared about me, that believed in me, that wanted to see me succeed. My teachers, my administrators in my schools, my coaches, club advisors, all of these adults that were rooting for me, wanting me to succeed. And uh, I, I just think that's what the power of school is. And sadly, not every child has somebody at home that is always rooting for them, believing in them, and inspiring them. And school can really be that place where those kids can, can have a shot. So that's something important I, I learned about school and I carry with me. Thanks. For me, it's um, connections with the teachers, even the principals, the custodians. I, I was a talker, I'll admit, I was a talker in school. Um, interrupt the class because I had to ask a question, you know, so <clears throat> I was always that person that needed to know more and more and more. So I love the part that, that is given. You know, the more I can get out of it, the better it was. So. Um, yeah, I was an energized bunny for sure in school. So yeah, um, just my thoughts and everything. So they helped me go through everything. And you're right, um, a lot of people don't have that at home. And I was one of those kids. And so school really helped me show me how to grow up to who I am today. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. And it's, uh, do you support, uh, or do you think the efforts of the current school administration uh, to communicate with parents, with the public and parents uh, is enough or should they be doing more? And Shelley, can we start with you? Um, 
I think that um, there could always be improvements. Um, I think starting with, um, I, I would commit being on the school committee, making myself available um, via email, phone call, in-person meeting with any constituent that has concerns or wants to discuss um, issues that, they, um, that they're concerned about. Uh, I happen to know several of the school committee um, members, but I also know that um, communication can always be improved. We mostly have you know, email and social media as ways to get information out, out there, but I think, um, and occasionally putting letters in the um, students' folders um, to go home. But I think we could improve upon that, um, recognizing that um, you know, some parents don't have consistent um, internet access. Um, some parents work double shifts and forget to check the folder you know, for weeks on, um, you know, at a time. Um, so I think just adding as many um, vehicles of communication as possible with the uh, um, district to the parents as well as just the wider community. I think that can also improve in communication. Thank you. Thank you for this question. I do believe that um, the current administration for our Bangor schools has made fantastic strides to really create a sense of um, communication and open transparency. Um, but one of the reasons I'm running for school board is because I know that there needs to always be more. Um, creating that sense of community where parents know where to go, they know who to talk to, they know how to get their questions answered, and they feel comfortable doing so um, is so important. Uh, being able to work with community organizations to um, create more avenues for parents, students and families to get the information that they need um, and to really support our teachers to feel like they, the community that they have at school is something that they feel supported in and that the place that they want to work. Um, these are all things that I think that we can do better. Um, as a uh, candidate, I've had amazing conversations with parents who really want there to be um, some better avenues, and I'm, I'm interested in making that happen um, and creating real culture shift here in Bangor. Thank you. Communication by the administration. Yes, definitely. There needs to be, um, they need to listen to the teachers. They need to listen to the counselors, and they need to listen to social workers. Um, the communication is only one-sided a lot of times, I've heard. And I, that's why I'm running. Um, it's not fair. Um, the administration has to speak up more and listen more to these people that know what is best for our students um, instead of shutting them down when they are telling them something that's important. Um, so um, the, yeah, I've already know all about this, so yeah. <laughs> so they do need to listen more and communicate more. Thank you for this question, and yes, I, I think communication, as uh, everyone said, can always be improved. Uh, the ways in which we communicate change rapidly. Uh, we've seen that uh, in recent years, and um, technology is a huge piece of it. Um, but I, in any organization I've ever belonged to where we were trying to improve communication, what seemed to really work best was to reach out to the folks that you're trying to communicate with and ask them what works best for them. Um, so as a school committee member, I'd be committed to, to advocating for that, reaching out uh, to school stakeholders and asking you know, what, what is working well in terms of communication between the school and, and you, and what do you see as improvements or areas where we can make some improvement? Thank you. And now for closing remarks, uh, two minutes from each candidate. And Sherry, let's start with you. I wasn't expecting to run. There's something that happened back in May, and we've been dealing with the school at the high school level. Um, had some meetings, 
now there is a need to run. Um, for one thing, our students are our future. We need to protect them. Bangor, I'm out there. I see what's going on. It's not good. Bang, the city council, they need to get working on more. Um, that's why I want to start off with the children first. We need to make sure they're in a safe place, uh, make sure all the buildings are updated, and make sure that when we go in and talk to them, I don't want to be just sitting on the board. I want to be into the schools. I want to talk to the teachers. I want to talk to the counselors and social workers to see what they need to improve their working conditions to there. So yeah, I am for safety and on the outside too, like I mentioned the sidewalks. We need more crossing guards, especially in the Hammond Street area. I mean, we got little ones crossing that road and that's a busy road in the morning time. Um, there's a lot of things that we need to work on and my goal here is the children safety and I wanna be a voice for the children, the teachers and speak out for them. Thank you very much. Thank you again um, to the League of Women Voters, Downtown Bangor Partnership, and Hudson University for this opportunity. Tonight was way more fun than I thought it was going to be. I loved hearing all of the passion um, that these amazing individuals have for creating um, better schooling and better cultural opportunities for our students. Um, I want to reiterate that I, I truly understand the value of public education and that access. I was the kid that was at school because that's where an adult was and that's where I felt most taken care of. Um, it is why I recognize how much our teachers do and how much they pour into it. I have three children, um, two at Abraham Lincoln and one at Mary Snow. I am married to an educator and I have dedicated my life to working in schools to create inclusive opportunities um, and to create access, especially for our students with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, I want our schools to be a place that Everyone sees themselves, everyone feels like they belong, regardless of their religion, race, background, uh, zip code. Uh, I want them to have a childhood that is going to shape them into an incredible adult that is going to come up with amazing solutions for our world and be the leaders that we need. And I truly believe that our Bangor schools can do that. Uh, we have excellent teachers, we have excellent administrators, and we are doing more every single day to build that culture where everyone can see themselves belonging, and that's what I want to be a part of, and that is why I am running for school committee. My name is Katie Bryden, and I really hope to have your vote on or before uh, November 7th. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Right. Thanks again, everybody. I'd like to close this evening uh, by outlining key priorities I'll be committed to pursuing over the next three years. As our communities and schools continue to heal from the many negative impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, I'll advocate for the following. One, continued investment in student support services aimed at bolstering social, emotional, and psychological well-being of students attending Bangor Public Schools. This would include continued and expanded investment in system-wide mentoring, recruitment and retention of licensed school social workers, school counselors, school nurses, and school psychologists, and the leveraging of Bangor School Department's relationship with the Penobscot Community Health Care to offer students access to school-based health clinics. Two, it's been well documented that school closures and other school-related impacts of COVID-19 led to a loss of learning for our students, particularly from students from marginalized communities. Access to high-quality tutors, Literacy and mathematics coaches is effective at reversing learning loss, and I'll continue to advocate for these types of investments and other system-wide interventions and supports. During this past school year, I proudly served on the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Advisory Committee. I'll continue to advocate for this committee to be an important voice and source of guidance to Bangor school committee members, our system and building level administrators, and our educators. 
Collectively, the Bangor School Department has the strongest educators in Maine, and offering professional support is critical to maintaining that level of excellence. I'll advocate for exploring novel approaches to supporting early career teachers, such as collaborations with Maine Department of Education and teacher-focused organizations, such as the Penobscot River Educational Partnership, which is based at the University of Maine. Thank you again for this opportunity tonight, and I hope you'll consider voting for Tim Surratt for school committee in the weeks ahead or in person on November 7th. Thank you. Last but not least, um, <laughs> thank you, no, seriously. Um, thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting this. Um, thank you to Hudson University for um, allowing us to use your space. And obviously thank you to the candidates. Um, it's really an honor to be running alongside of you. I'm humbled that I can even be here and um, to possibly represent um, the community members of Bangor. And last but not least, thank you to the, the questions, uh, the community members who took the time out today to uh, come here today or watching streaming and submitted questions. I really appreci appreciated the questions. They were really thought provoking. Um, thank you to my husband um, for supporting me. Um, it's been tough, we're not there yet, but um, we're getting there. Um, I sh I'm truly happy to call Bangor home, um, like I said before. Um, I, one of the reasons that I chose Bangor is because of the school system. Um, and I want to continue to make the strides that I've seen um, Bangor made. I want to continue help to uh, make the strides that Bangor has made while I've been here. Um, some things that I want to continue, um, ha uh, help, conti help Bangor continue are um, promoting the culture that all students and staff are, are welcomed and feel belong, belong that they, they belong. Um, I want to um, continue to focus on the academic and um, social emotional success of students. Um, I want to continue um, increasing the communication and accountability um, within the school district and um, from the school district to the community. And honestly, I want to make sure that all students um, can find their Mrs. Moore. Um, another, backing up to the previous question about um, one of the important things that you've learned from school is just that there are Mrs. Moores out there. Um, and I just want to do what I can to make sure that um, students know that there's a Mrs. Moore for you. I hope that I can um, have your vote on November 7th or earlier, absentee ballot, uh, early voting. Um, thanks. And now you may applaud. <laughs> Thank you candidates very much. Um, everyone, uh, I'm gonna get Shelly to join the League of Women Voters. Please get out there and vote uh, in person on November 7th, starting on Tuesday. You can do um, uh, early voting, which isn't really early voting in Maine. Uh, you can go down to, in person to the city clerk's office uh, and cast a ballot. You can ask for a mail ballot but it doesn't matter how you do it, but get out there and vote. And we'll be voting, am I right, three members to city councils. I mean city, it's city council too, but city school committee. So um, candidates, thank you very much. Don't go away, in 10 minutes we'll have the city council. So we have um, index cards for you to write questions. We really are taking oral questions from the audience. We need you to write your questions down. We'll get up to the
So can city council uh, candidates make their way to the stage? City council candidates, can you make your way to the stage?
opening statement. It's going to be tough to get out of those chairs with so many candidates running. <laughs> so first of all, thank you so much to the League of Women Voters and Hudson University and the Downtown Bangor Partnership uh, for hosting this forum tonight. My name is Kim Boucher and I'm running to be your next city councilor. I thrive on teamwork and on collaboration and I look forward to working with the other councilors to make data informed decisions on, the beha on behalf of the residents of Bangor. I am not in this to have some sort of platform or to say that I have all of the answers. I am willing to show up to do the hard, unglamorous work of governing. I won't just talk. I will come to meetings prepared and having done all the reading. I don't burn bridges, I build them. I have been a nonprofit professional for 16 years, completing a master's in business administration and have worked in many roles to help nonprofits achieve their missions on tiny budgets. In my day job, I raise money um, to make healthcare more accessible for people across the state of Maine. As a grant writer, I, I seek to share the stories of vulnerable and impacted individuals, and I will continue to share your stories on City Council. I have a new, unique perspective because I am also a local landlord who is making a concert, con conscious and concerted effort to maintain my properties uh, while, keep, while working to keep rents affordable for tenants. When we moved to Bangor, I immediately felt like this was my home. And when you find your home, you get to work to make it the best place that, can, that it can be. I want Bangor to be a place that my kids love as much as I do and that they will want to stay here and raise their families here. It's for that reason that I commit so much of my time volunteering on the Parks, Rec, and Harbor Committee, the Maine Multicultural Center, the Bangor Area Recovery Center, um, Dignity First, and my local PTO. I do all of this, and I have kids, so I'm definitely never bored. But I do all of this because I, am genuinely, I genuinely love this city, and I'm grateful to call it home, and I would appreciate your vote so I can continue to serve this city that I love. tight squeeze getting out of that table. Um, first of all, thank you to the League of Women Voters and the Downtown Bangor Partnership and Hudson University for hosting us all tonight. It's a large group over here. So no matter how much money is in our wallets, who we love, the color of our skin, or how long we've called Bangor home, we believe in caring for our families and leaving things better for those to come. Our city is a beautiful place, brimming with potential. but. For too long, a handful of decision makers have resisted delivering on the things our city needs to thrive. Some of us give our all as teachers, firefighters, small business owners, nurses, or volunteers serving our city. But time and again, we've heard that things like creating more affordable housing, a more walkable city, or a healthier, safer city that honors the humanity of people who are struggling are just too hard and out of our reach. I'm Morgan Pottle Urquhart, and I'm running for city council because it's time we rewrite the rules and ensure we all have what we need to thrive. Our commitment to each other can be stronger than any obstacles in our path. Together, we can make Bangor the city we all know she can be. Thank you. Thank you. Hal. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. I hope you're all registered voters. I'm going to dispense with the uh, usual biographical information and plunge right into what I believe is a crisis in our city. First of all, I will let you know that I have served on the city council twice before and it was never my intention to run again, but here I am, and I'll tell you why. I'll give you an example. At five o'clock this afternoon, our city council held 
a special meeting to discuss a serious issue, the issue of whether a physically and emotionally challenged individual who lives in our city would be allowed to keep a couple of chickens as part of his therapy. Well, this is serious. This violates the zoning ordinances. So the council is going right to work to handle it. This is the same city council that for the past two and a half years has been wringing its hands over the problem of the homeless, most specifically the transient homeless who have come to Bangor to set up their camps and literally live in a shanty town, and who have, for the most part, refused housing when it was offered to them. And now the council has told us that they want another 12 to 18 months to study the plan and come up with an answer. Too long, too little, and too late. And so I'm running for council to add my voice and my concern to those of many law-abiding, tax-paying citizens of our community who are frankly fed up with this situation. A city council is elected to serve its citizens' concerns. And I say it's about time you had a council like that. Thank you. Shall we? Sorry. <laughs> well, Carolyn. Good evening, my name is Carolyn Fish and I'm running for city council because I have been a lifelong, uh, well since I was 15, so it's been um, many decades that uh, Bangor was my base home where I got my first job at 15 at Sayers, if anyone here remembers that. And um, I've worked hard. Bangor has offered me through my lifetime a lot of opportunities and uh, it's been a great city. I love Bangor. It's been where I have um, had my children, raised my children. Um, I've been married here, baptized my children here. And um, I see Bangor um, perhaps not being able to offer those same privileges that I had growing up as far as opportunity. Um, I felt it was a healthy and prosperous community. And we, we work together as a community. And I just feel that the past few decades, um, we've seen a lot of separation um, from us with our differences of opinion. And I think we need to pull together as a community and work together, even though we might have different opinions. And I think that we have problems in the city um, and it's made me sad. And that's why I decided to get involved and try to work with um, other organizations and try to face the problems, work hard at the problems. I've been a realtor for 40 years, and I've helped hundreds of families come into Bangor. I've seen and heard why they come, and I've heard and seen why they leave. So I think I've got a front row kind of grassroots um, um, opportunity to see those opportunities and problems of, of how we might compete with other cities, why they're coming and going, and maybe learn from those people as well as what we might be able to do better. Uh, I think that our, I have some old-fashioned values uh, from my family, and I think today I still have faith that those old-fashioned values do have a place in today's world. I know it's changing, but I think that people can expect to have a healthy and prosperous community. I think it's something we all want. We all want fairness, and we all want to be able to um, have the opportunity to work and have careers and, and work together as a community. Um, it's been my base town. I love Bangor, and it's been good to me for all of these years. So um, I'd like to give back. Mike? You guys want to 
move your chairs back and be a little bit more relaxed. I'm sorry. You're all squeezed together there. I got drawn last to be on the ballot, so this feels like an upgrade. Uh, thank you to the League of Women Voters, uh, Downtown Bangor Partnership, and Hudson University for hosting this event. It's an opportunity to get to know all of the candidates who are running for city council and understand who you're voting for. Uh, I'm Michael Beck. I'm running for city council, and I'm motivated to run because I want my kids to know a better Bangor. Uh, I want them to know the Bangor my wife remembers from when she grew up here and said to me one day, honey, I'm homesick, let's move home. And I said, okay. And I want my kids to know the Bangor that I got to go out know almost nine years ago with great schools and wonderful parks and great downtown and just said this is the place we came to the right place. That even better. We got some issues that we need to fix and it starts with housing and it starts with community well-being and it starts with taking care of our public employees. I'm ready to roll up my sleeves and get to work on these issues but I need the job first, <laughs> and that's why I'm here today, to tell you more about my vision and to ask for your vote on November 7th, because together we can address these issues, and we will. Because I want a Bangor that my children one day will look back and say, you know what, to their partner, hey, honey, I miss home. Let's move home. Thank you. Next, I'm going to advocate for one more table, actually. <laughs> um, I, so I want to thank the League of Women Voters, Huston University, and Downtown Bangor Partnership for organizing this forum. It's good to have these to do primarily over Zoom uh, no more. <laughs> My name is Joseph Leonard. I have served one year on city council, and I'm running for re-election. After seeing the inside of how our city operates over the course of the last year, we have addressed not just one, but multiple crises that have caused our workers and our citizens stresses that are very frightening. Let's just keep it real. While there are a myriad of topics that need to be further discussed and strategized over, I want to cover three topics that our new council in November, in my personal opinion, must act on before any other business is discussed. Number one. City workers, essential workers, our emergency response workers, and teachers, and so on, must be supported full stop. Our upcoming budget season is going to be another hard one, and there are issues regarding these subjects that must be addressed, but Bangor needs to make it very clear we support our workers, and we are going to work toward making this a competitive, thriving city instead of one that is just trying to survive. Two, our government needs more transparency now more than ever. I was very critical at the start of how the city handled the ARPA evaluation process. However, it showed me that we need to do more coordination between not just our other counselors, but other municipal leaders in the county and our legislative leaders as well. If Bangor is to thrive, we must work proactively with our fellow leaders and be honest and transparent with our citizens about what we are planning, whether it's housing, how we address the homeless crisis, so on. Number three, we need an elected mayor. Bangor's municipal structure is not an ideal one. Counselors are restricted from talking with one another outside of scheduled meetings, and that forces staff to be more reactive to crises instead of being proactive. When reelected, one of the first things I will motion for is for the council to start the process of rewriting our charter to implement an elected mayor municipality. If that fails, I will personally begin the process to make this a local ballot question for Bangor voters to decide in 2024. Bangor is a long road to go, but uh, I think we are able to solve a lot of complex problems in the coming years. Thank you so much. Thank you. No, no applause, please. Susan, and I'm sorry I have her nameplate spelled wrong. It's Susan Dean with an E at the end of Dean. Susan. Good evening. My name is Susan Dean, with an E, and I'm running for City Council. I want to thank the League of Women Voters, Huston University, and the Downtown Bangor Partnership for sponsoring this event tonight. I'm a longtime resident of Bangor, 
I started my high school career here at John Baptist High School, later transferred to Hamden Academy. I attended Colby College and the University of Maine. I was known as Sue Diamond then, some of you may remember me. My son James graduated from Bangor High and the University of Maine, and he still lives in Maine, though he's in southern Maine. I have owned property in Bangor for over 30 years. I have made a career in dentistry, and I am currently the practice manager at Northeast Oral Surgery. I'm also a current member of the Board of Appeals. I like to say that I live, I work, eat, play, and pay taxes in Bangor. I absolutely love this little city that we live in. I decided to run for city council so I could share my skills and my thoughtfulness in the hopes of bringing Bangor back. Bangor has been suffering for the past few years with issues of homelessness, addiction, and slow economic growth. I aim to work with the other council members to combat these issues. A vote for me is a vote for a better Bangor. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Philip Henry, and uh, first off, I want to thank the League of Women Voters and the Downtown Business Par Partnership in Huston for hosting. It's nice to be able to get to know the other candidates and, um, and for everyone that made it out here tonight. And I didn't expect to be here, quite frankly. Um, so a little, little bit of background. We've lived in Bangor since 2006. I'm from St. John, New Brunswick. Graduated from chemical engineering at uh, University of New Brunswick. Uh, got hired in Boston, and when we started to have children, we decided that we had an opportunity to move to Bangor. And I didn't, never thought that I would find myself two hours from St. John as my permanent resident. Uh, and uh, but raising our family here and choosing to come here because of the fact that my wife could uh, and I could afford a home, a starter home to uh, raise our family and uh, in a safe environment, community-centered environment. Um, and, and we are so blessed that we did. We, I learned, a, I love this city of Bangor. The infrastructure is incredible for, this, for the am amount of population we have. To have uh, concerts and to have a neighboring city like Brewer and um, uh, uh, 45 minutes to Acadia. And, but the challenge uh, that we're seeing right now with homelessness and people leaving the city because, um, you know, we don't have um, a prioritization on economic development and even gaps in the housing market. We have people and people that are working at the hospital trying to recruit surgeons and doctors and attorneys and, and staff is, are finding it extremely challenging to do that because of the lack of housing. And, um, and so I'm here to, to leverage some of the things that, that I've learned over my career in sales uh, and engineering, and I, I, I like to use data-centric decision-making to um, be able to use facts to guide uh, the decisions that we make. And I think change is, it's time for some change, and uh, I'd love to continue to foster the growth of, of Bangor and, um, and continue to, um, to make it a, a place that's safe and uh, so that our population can enjoy all of the things that it has to offer. But thank you so much, appreciate it. Thank you. Now I got all the candidates, right? <laughs> okay, good. Uh, as I said, there are two prepared questions. And uh, Joe, I think we'll start with you. And the first prepared, uh, the question that they had in advance was, what should Bangor do to move forward? This is actually my uh, favorite question to uh, write up a response to, because um, th there's a lot of potential avenues of approach. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. In order for Bangor to progress forward into the future, we must lay down the foundations for that growth to commence. That means we have to continue to advocate for the most vulnerable and build programs and organizations that reduce recidivism rates, help people get into the workforce and help people afford to live in a home during a time where no one working one minimum wage job can even survive, not just in this city, but anywhere in this country. 
we also must invest in our infrastructure, whether that is investing in affordable homes, paving and plowing our streets and sidewalks, helping businesses and entrepreneurs access faster, more reliable internet, or improving our communication from the citizens to the city. Our growth will only happen when we lay down the foundations for that growth to occur. And the biggest pillar of that foundational growth is our children. We must continue to support our schools. We must continue to provide healthcare services to all children. And we must aspire to achieve really a dream that my uh, friend and colleague, Jonathan Sprague, has been saying for years now. Bangor has to make a guarantee no child will be homeless in our city. Children who remain homeless will continue to be homeless during their adult years and that will continue to eat up resources for the foreseeable future. If we want to end chronic homelessness, we must respond to it at its most nefarious root by eradicating childhood poverty in Bangor. Thank you. Morgan? And Morgan, is that the name you prefer? Morgan? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> So my top priorities for moving Bangor forward are affordable housing, evidence-based harm reduction, and fair pay for public workers. These needs are urgent and interconnected. When we talk about things like syringe litter and trash on the streets, we're not just talking about a drug problem, it's a housing crisis. People need stable housing in order to think about anything other than survival, let alone making it to a doctor's appointment or treatment. And we need more affordable housing across the board at every level. We can take steps to create more quality and affordable housing by looking to other places that have started to make progress. We can use incentives to encourage the construction of new housing that includes community spaces and supports to help people stay on track. At the end of the day, projects like these not only help those who are struggling, but the added housing can drive down property taxes for current homeowners. The staggering loss of life due to overdose demands evidence-based harm reduction tools. Harm reduction doesn't just mean safe consumption sites and needle exchanges. It's about reducing harm associated with drug use so that people can lead healthier, safer lives on their own terms. Instead of stigmatizing or criminalizing them, harm reduction offers support and resources to keep them alive, get them the services they need, and minimize the risk to themselves and the community. It means education, outreach, and connection to services, substance checking, and providing naloxone. Harm reduction provides safe disposal containers, wound care to people who may end up in the emergency room, and rapid disease testing to prevent outbreaks. We must prioritize human life and public health over political optics and implement strategies that have been proven to be effective. And none of the progress we need to see will be possible without investing in our public workforce. We need to make sure city staff is fairly compensated and equipped to perform essential jobs like street cleanup, snow removal, sidewalk repair, public transportation, and of course, our first responders. They deserve our respect and fair pay. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I think there's a, it's, it's a consensus that one of the biggest challenges in Bangor is the homeless situation. And I think that um, it is a complex issue. There's, this is a, a pandemic across North America. So I, I believe that um, there's no simple solution, however, to take, to take a broad brush across homelessness and say th that that is um, they're all in the same category would be unfair to say there is drug addiction there's poverty there's mental health issues and then there's um, there, there are people that have found themselves uh, in a situation where they need some assistance and and I think we as a community certainly um, owe it to um, ourselves and to them to to help out I think um, it is a complex solution and it requires data and it requires a collaborative uh, council to be able to have a task force to really uh, put a priority on addressing that because the general public right now uh, have a hard time going and, and enjoying um, the parks, the trail systems that we have as it stands. Um, and quite frankly, a beautiful public library in downtown Bangor, um, you know, people can't enjoy that because of the situation that we're in right now. And so uh, it, it, is a, it is a priority. And so uh, that would be the first thing. The second thing is to support small businesses and entrepreneurship. 
that is the lifeblood of, of any economy. And uh, the nonprofits, um, obviously, uh, once funds like ARPA are dried up, uh, they rely on for-profit companies to support them. And so we need to be supportive of entrepreneurship and small business to be able to employ people, to be able to have people move to the city. And so, uh, and then the last thing is because of um, my background in real estate, um, we need to look at the gaps in the real estate offering. Um, everything from first time home buyers being able to come to this area and enter into a home at an affordable price so that they're not mortgage poor like they would be in a large city. That is a, an offering that we can bring to the table. It differentiates us as Bangor. And um, yes, thank so thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Caroline. Carol Wynn. How should Bangor move forward? I think for a better future, and even before we can even think about moving forward, we have to fix today. I think we have to focus on today. How can we make today better? How can we make today stronger? And we have to take care of that before we can be prepared for the future. We have to reinforce the foundation that our predecessors built that made this city great in the first place. We, so that our future generations can have the same opportunities that I had growing up. So they can build careers, and they can have a home, and they can uh, have a job here in our community. I, I think we need to take a, a deep, serious look at where we're at and how did we get here. It's changed in the last five years, from 10 years, from 15 years ago. What's happened? Why? What, what could we have done different, and what can we start doing different now to try to address these serious problems. I would dedicate myself to working on these problems. I'm a team-spirited person. I've always had a team in my career. I love working with other groups and people, and I love to really uh, identify what the issues are, what the problems are, and really focus on priorities, and then take action. I think that's imperative. We have to fix today, and we have to do it together. Um, as a leader, I also think that the council has an, a priority, an obligation, and a responsibility to be a steward for the city, the entire city, everybody, not one group. I know we have groups that do need some extra attention and some help. Our homeless, you don't have to, um, you, all you have to do is drive through town and or any street. We have a sad um, situation with the homeless, and we do have to make that a priority. But there's a lot of residents that are struggling with other issues too, within their, within their work community, within the job situation to keep employees and uh, to keep their doors open. Um, housing, uh, it's not affordable. You know, I've heard about you know, the streets. There's a lot of people in a, with a lot of concerns and we have to hear them all, but we have to prioritize. Thank you. Thank you. Mike? It's a good question, it's an important one. Bangor is facing many challenges and it's gonna require some fresh thinking and some urgent action. A few things we can do specifically, we can invest in substance use disorder treatment. That includes medically assisted treatment and peer recovery centers. We can collaborate with groups like the Bangor Area Recovery Community Coalition who meets every fourth Monday of the month. <coughs> And we can also collaborate with groups like Penobscot County Cares, where they've done the work networking and bringing people together who are working on these issues, who have great ideas. They just need to be heard. So let's bring them to City Hall and let's talk to them and let's work out a plan together. Let's make housing affordability a priority. More zoning for more density. Changing zoning for more density. Uh, build a housing trust fund is an idea. Uh, we can push for more state and federal dollars that's out there. We're missing opportunities. We need to apply for those, those dollars. We can adopt an economic strategy for supporting small businesses and revitalizing downtown. And we can upgrade public transit to expand hours, add routes, try new ideas like on-demand transit, 
like microtransit. Reliable transportation connects people to jobs. But above all else, we can't do any of this unless we have a comprehensive strategic plan. We can't just piecemeal this. We need to collaborate with the community, and that's going to take listening to residents, collaborating with the community, tackling issues head on, and drive and push for results. And that's what I'll do as a counselor. Thank you. So Bangor has lots of plans, from the Housing Work Group Report, the Livable Communities Action Plan, the Transit Study, all the way to the most recent comprehensive plan. We have plans for days. These plans have all had varying levels of community input, and we should be really proud of the great foundation that has been laid. There are some really great ideas in there, and but where we struggle is when it comes from uh, to moving those great visions forward. This is going to take strong leadership from the city staff and the council to move from words to action. It's going to take a collective will from the council to set a strategic direction and then to follow it. But each councillor is but one decision maker out of nine. Sometimes people run for council because they are more interested in the sound of their own voice or in complaining about city management than they are about building consensus and actually getting things done. So, how do we move Bangor forward? We start by enacting the vision laid out in all of these great plans. There are places where great changes are already happening with ordinances, and zoning changes allowing for accessory, accessory dwelling units and tiny home development. The council must use their collective will to keep moving things forward together. We also need to be responsive when our plans may have missed some important issues. For instance, we have to move, work closely with our fire and de police departments to help them address staffing needs. We can't move Bangor forward without making sure we are also delivering on the basics. This means getting recycling up and running and ensuring our sidewalks and streets are safe and accessible for all. These plans can't just sit on the shelf. They must be used to set strategic objectives along with a strong roadmap to get there. Taking plans and putting them into action is something I do every day in my work and I look forward to working with the other councillors and city staff to find meaningful solutions. Well, I'm hearing some very fine comments on this topic. The question is, when one is elected to council, will he or she put in the no amount of time and effort required to get these things moving? That's a very big question. It takes time, a lot of time, and a lot of energy. Now, as far as how to make Bangor grow, I think before any plan is developed, there should be a survey of some kind, in some way, of people who are under 40, because it's their city that they're going to be living in for the next 30 to 40 years. You can lead a horse to water, but you know the rest of it. And so, we can grow only to the extent that we know where our citizens want to grow. My particular interest is, of course, in economic development. I was a marketing representative for the Economic Development Office back in 1987, and I was making very good progress in recruiting industries in other states in New England to relocate to Bangor. Now, relocation takes a couple of three years, but we had some very good prospects. I wish I could tell you about one of them, but I don't have the time. So I think what we need to do as counselors is inquire exactly 
what the strategy of our Economic Development Department is. Our Economic Development Officer is now serving as the Planning Officer as well. I think that's a pretty heavy load for one person. And I have never given up on the idea that Bangor could still be a home to light manufacturing. That's a thing that I'm really anxious to get going. And so I don't have time to say more, but one final thing is, in order to grow, we have to give business an even break and a fair shake. How do we move forward? As I look out at the audience, I realize that each of you probably would have a very different answer on how to move forward. My thought on this is that the citizens need to elect a city council who will work together towards a common goal. Once elected, this council will work for the greater good of the Bangor residents and the Bangor business owners. I am one of the candidates who will work hand in hand with the existing council to accomplish these goals. Together, we can help to combat homelessness, find resources for addiction, and increase economic growth by revitalizing our downtown and reinvigorating our citizens. Diverse views with common goals. It is very important for us to have our own opinions but it's also very important for us to come to a common conclusion. My feeling about moving forward is uniting Bangor and creating a city council who will work for everyone in Bangor. Thank you. Second question is from the downtown partnership, and it's rather lengthy. <clears throat> downtown Bangor is home to over 3,000 residents, and daytime workforce visitor population averages 14,000 people per day. It is home to public parks and significant works of art and architecture, as well as historic and cultural assets. In recent years, downtown has also experienced a considerable uptick in activity from those struggling with mental health, substance abuse disorder, and houselessness. How would you prioritize maintaining a safe and clean environment in downtown while still ensuring the needs of our struggling, still ensuring that the needs of our struggling citizens are met. And how would you go first? How would you go first? I think the questions, or well, the question contains many of the answers. One of my fondest dreams having grown up in Bangor since 1946, when downtown Bangor was a wonderland of retail establishments, and you could find almost anything you needed. The mall has fallen on hard times. I think it's time to grab this opportunity to encourage full-scale retail redevelopment in downtown Bangor. We have plenty of restaurants, we have plenty of bars, we have enough tattoo shops and head shops. I want to see a downtown Bangor that's thriving again, a downtown Bangor that will be a gathering place for the people of this community on a Friday or Saturday night. Bangor certainly has so many assets Parks was mentioned, and I want to say right here and now that I am so terribly proud of Tracy Willette 
and his Parks and Recreation Department. Our parks have never been better kept or better maintained. Very little litter anymore, and the grass is cut. It, it's, it's wonderful what they're doing. So that's my focus, retail and continued support and improvement of our public facilities. Thank you very much. Well, the question the question is quite complex in in uh, in terms of solving that in one small two minute discussion. But what I will say is that um, the in, the initial priority is that geographically locating um, support services for the homeless or drug addicted in amongst an environment where entrepreneurs are trying to conduct business is probably not the most efficient way to do that. So. Imagine hypothetically you have a bagel place that you're trying to run and outside of that there is someone sleeping on a park bench with perhaps a shopping cart filled with debris and so forth. Um, that would impact your ability to com conduct business. And so I think just separating geographically the two different needs of two different populace and so that if someone was to come into town and we were to try and promote additional entrepreneurship, additional restaurateurs, and so forth to attract um, people to this region, I think that would be step one. The other piece of it is that because through the pandemic we've had such a large remote workforce, it's, such, it's a huge opportunity to now go to places like Boston where my wife and I could barely afford, if we were both working full time in very high paying jobs, we might have been able to afford a home you could come up to this region because of this remote opportunity and, and uh, companies are now realizing that their productivity is, is, is not decreasing when, we, when they have remote workers. So having some sort of an economic development um, initiative to try and um, recruit and, and promote that sort of thing to the downtown uh, region of Bangor so that we can grow economically, reduce taxes for the, um, you know, for the, for the mill rate for the existing homeowners of Bangor. So, because as people leave, um, the financial burden is left with those who want to stay in this uh, incredible city. So, that would be my uh, answer. Thank you. How would I prioritize maintaining a safe, clean environment um, well in turn the needs of struggling citizens? I think it's pretty hard to put one of those as a priority over the other. I think safety, health, um, the environment um, is very, all are, are equally important. They're, they're intertwined. I don't believe life was meant to live and die on the streets. Uh, the safety and welfare of all is top priority. And um, as Phil had said, it's, it's, um, we need to keep our businesses healthy and thriving as well. They're the backbone of our economic stability. And at the same time, we have um, homeless and, and mental health issues out on the street, people that need our help. Um, so I think that it's, it's very complicated and, um, uh, and it's not going to be solved overnight, that's for sure. It didn't happen overnight. Um, I, I think it's essential to know how and why um, the problem started, how we got the uptick recently, I guess we have an uptick, how, how can we identify what the root of the problem is and, and how can we prevent it. If we can figure out what the problem is and we can prevent it perhaps with education, um, risk management, support programs, collaboration with local, state, and government agencies, and organize and channel those services, um, it, it may help. We need housing. Uh, we all talked about the housing. Um, it, I think with the economic growth and development, uh, hand in hand with housing that could possibly help um, the problem too. This is not a unique problem to Bangor. The two um, largest contributing factors to homelessness are substance abuse and mental health issues. I wish I had a profound answer, but I don't. 
It's a multifaceted, complicated question requiring more research, collaboration, conversations, and many more questions. It didn't occur overnight, and it won't be solved overnight. Thank you. Mike? I want to start by saying I understand the concerns about public safety and cleanliness downtown, and no one should ever feel threatened uh, or be unable to access a local business. But let's also be clear, uh, unhoused people struggling downtown, they're not there to cause problems. They're there because they have unmet needs. And the most effective long-term solution, of course, is more affordable housing, uh, treatment, and targeted outreach. You know, housing first works. But the key is, housing first does not mean housing only. If you put someone in housing and you don't give them the wraparound services they need to survive, you are setting them up to fail, and that is not fair to anybody. Long-term solutions take time. So in the short, short term, we can take the downtown Bangor uh, partnership and we can contract with Street Plus. Uh, they offer supplemental sanitation and outreach that treats people like people. Social services, outreach workers, working together to help people and get their immediate needs addressed while we get long-term solutions implemented. So business owners can actually worry about their businesses and not have to also be social workers. I'm ready to re work with the community to find other solutions too. As a counselor, it's my job and all of our jobs as counselors to find, to do compassionate policy making and combine it with practical steps. And as a community, we can balance public safety while upholding human dignity, and that's what we should be doing in Bangor, and as your counselor, that's what I'll see that we do. Thank you. Thank you. Susan. I have spoken with city officials and mental health workers, and they are in agreement that Bangor has reached its limit as far as the number of homeless people that it can support. We need to deal with the homeless population that we have now and stop allowing our outerlying communities to send more and more people to our city. It's not fair to the people who are seeking refuge, and it's not fair to our city of Bangor. Our parks and our downtown have become overrun with these individuals as they have nowhere to go. We need to try to reunite as many of these folks with their families in their community where they have a support system. I think that's something that isn't done as much as it should be and I think we really need to look into helping them find people that will support them more than strangers. We need to have better state support to ensure the resources for these individuals are allocated correctly. I know there are some federal funds that also can be allocated. They may be more difficult to come by, but we need to tap into these funds. Our downtown is a beautiful, or could be a beautiful place, but it is being overrun, and we need to try to help not only the homeless, but the addicted and our business owners. I'm hoping that if I am elected, I will be able to bring our downtown back to the way it used to be, and perhaps even better. Thank you. Thank you. Jim? It's a constant little do -si do but first of all, this question was long, and it's a lot to cover in two minutes. But first of all, I love our downtown. It's one of the reasons I moved here. We have beautiful parks and restaurants and shops. We have murals and music and events that make Bangor a destination that people from all over want to visit. Does that mean that Bangor is perfect? No. We all know that the very visible presence of people suffering uh, and living unsheltered 
in our city impacts the downtown businesses. It colors people's perception of Bangor, and it makes visitors, employees, residents, and business owners feel unsafe. We need to provide safety by having more staff dedicated to clean up, to deal with challenging personalities, or even restrict some areas where people can spend the night or gather during the day. We also need to proactively change the narrative of Bangor being a dangerous place and to shine a light, both literally and figuratively, adding more lighting, but also bringing more vibrant activities downtown to curb unwanted behaviors. We also need to value the humanity of individuals who are unhoused here in Bangor. These are brothers and sisters. These are mothers and fathers. These are folks who have experienced extreme hardship and generational trauma. But these are our neighbors. I believe it is possible to support our local businesses and also provide support to our unhoused neighbors. This is not an either or. But most importantly, we have to deal with the root cause of this issue, which, which is housing. Emergency and transitional housing don't work for everyone for a variety of reasons, and Bangor should look towards the housing first model as a proven path forward. We need creative solutions as well, and one that I've been thinking about is a syringe redemption program. Much like bottle redemption, this would pay a small sum per needle safely returned. More sharps, containers, and trash cans downtown would help, and hopefully when I knock on one of your doors, we can continue to have these conversations. Thank, Thank you. you. Joe? Well, as uh, one of the uh, 3,000 residents of downtown, um, having lived and worked there for uh, a little bit over a decade now, um, uh, I, I, I have seen all the changes that have occurred in the downtown area. I've seen many positive things occurred, and I've also seen some things that have you know, rightly, alarm citizens. It has become clear that downtown Bangor has created an economic powerhouse due to our innovative restaurant owners, artists, business leaders, entrepreneurs, physicians, professors, thespians, the list goes on and on. And we can talk about how vibrant and spectacular our downtown has become, not just for Bangor, but for the entire state. But because of this wild vibrancy, I was, when I first got on the council, shocked at how little communication there was with downtown business leaders working alongside councilors and other municipal leaders and county leaders. And worse, when the homeless crisis hit, our downtown was hit harder than anywhere else in the city. It became clear to business leaders and many other leaders in downtown that we have to respond to this crisis in a way that is humane while also helping those who have invested in making the downtown what it is today. I'm proud to say that I was the most outspoken counselor on the Street Plus initiative earlier to help business leaders who were heavily impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, to help workers respond to a backlog of issues by implementing new workers to help with these backlogged issues. Our city workers are hard workers, but they are only human. And I can say that I will continue to advocate for our downtown leaders to make sure that such initiatives are to be seriously considered instead of being backlogged and tabled for another year. Thank you. Morgan? It's a long question, and I think my answer might be as long. Um, <laughs> I mentioned earlier some of the strategies around housing and harm reduction that I think will help meet the needs of people who are unhoused, struggling with mental health challenges, or using drugs. And I think those are the things we need to focus on in the long term. That includes social services, outreach, harm reduction. Uh, there's also a proposal that was mentioned earlier um, from the Downtown Bangor Partnership that I think can help us fill a gap. There are some services that the city has refused to take seriously, like street cleanup, that will take time to build city staff capacity to meaningfully take on. Long term, I think street cleanup work should be done by public employees. Short term, I support a street plus proposal for a time limited contract until the public workforce can fill that need. Thank you. Did everyone get a chance to answer that question? 
I'm sorry that, that uh, time is going by so fast and I should have done better arithmetic. We have this many questions from the audience or that were gotten to me beforehand, but we only have time for one more question and um, closing statements. So Morgan, I should have asked you to stay up here. We'll start with you. How would you encourage entrepreneurship, innovation, the growth of small business and light industry to come to Bangor? So I think uh, that starts with having conversations with businesses who are already here, seeing what the, uh, what the benefits of being in Bangor are. I know we have some really wonderful businesses here. Uh, and, and really seeing what the challenges are and what barriers need to be uh, removed in order to ensure their success. Um, I, I know that sometimes there are, um, there are existing ordinances that have probably been on the books for a long time that were passed maybe 30 years ago that don't really have an application in Bangor now. And are those really helping the city? Are they making it harder for uh, for businesses to navigate starting a business here. Uh, I, I think that's something that we should have conversations with business owners about um, how, how to encourage future growth. Thank you. Susan. Downtown Bangor, as we know, is a wonderful place for us to frequent. I live in walking distance to downtown. I go to the bagel shop, I go to the museums, we go to dinner. It's an absolutely wonderful place for us to spend time. And we do need to encourage more shops, more restaurants, more cultural events. And how do we do that? We have to make it more attractive. We need to beautify downtown, things like flowers, Christmas decorations, things that we do just to make our downtown enjoyable, really will bring people in. The entrepreneurs are, are here. I think we need to partner with them. We need to find out how they go about doing their things. Um, we have developers here. There's a lot of development happening. I don't know exactly who we would speak with. This is all fairly new to me, but I think if we partner with the existing people, we would be able to bring in more business and definitely make our downtown a place that we could be proud of. Thank you. Carolyn. Working with um, people coming in to Bangor for 40 years from uh, away, looking for houses either for job opportunities through um, the hospitals and universities. I will tell you, they fall in love with Bangor. Bangor sells itself. It's beauty with the river, um, the parks, uh, the architecture we have. Um, and then they're amazed that we actually have Children's Museum. We have the Deepwater River that brings in cruise ships. Um, we, have, um, we, we have so much to offer, the universities, major medical. Bangor kind of sells itself. And I think that um, once we, we get you know, the attention, uh, we, we get attracted to the people of, that have a lot of opportunities to bring to Bangor, I think we have to figure out how to keep them here. There's a lot of ideas and research done um, with economic development on a local and state level in the universities. And with the young people coming up, it would be um, you know, really good to reach out to them to see what they see as up and rising interest that they have, that they would like to bring that art and that work into Bangor. So uh, I think we have a lot to attract them and um, keeping them here would be, would be the, the key focus. The best way to encourage new business, entrepreneurship, small business, is to stop the practice of imposing more and more regulations and restrictions and higher permitting fees. 
show these people who want to do business in Bangor that they're welcome, we value them, and that we're not here to penalize them. We're here to help them. Thank you very much. I think I would agree um, with Hal on that side of, uh, you know, fewer restrictions and hurdles, support for entrepreneurs and courageous business owners that are trying to take an idea and manifest it into reality. Uh, I will talk as a real estate developer and a real estate investor that some of the things that, that Bank was challenged with is housing. And so um, perhaps some sort of feasibility study partnership, a win-win with the city. Let's, let's uh, put some skin in the game. We'll pay for the feasibility study. If it works out, then and uh, perhaps some sort of a tax abatement for a few years until the development becomes fully occupied, stabilized, and then now we have um, a, a, a real estate development that meets the needs of the housing uh, crisis in Bangor, but also allows um, the, the ta additional tax revenue. It also allows um, recruits from the hospital and for um, high paying jobs, uh, people to come in and, and have, a, have a place to uh, call home. So I would say, um, yeah, just additional tax incentives from the city and win-win for, uh, for people that are willing to put their capital at risk. Thank you. Thank you. Question for the audience. Uh, who's got one of these right here? Who's got one of these? So that device has access to 25% of the entire United States economy, probably more so than that now, last time I checked. There's a little city by the name of uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, that relied heavily on steel workers throughout the entirety of its uh, city's uh, uh, creation. Those workers lost a lot of their jobs, and that city fell into a similar crisis that Maine fell into when a lot of our paper mills left the area as well. They are having a huge turnaround right now by the investment in technology right now, and we can do the exact same thing here. And as Bill Gates just said recently, we have entered the era of artificial intelligence. This is something that we need to invest in. I think school committee had one of the hardest questions today, which was how are you going to dictate how you spend time with the artificial intelligence with children? That's a really difficult question. I'm not going to touch it. But when it comes to the adults, 100%, we have to invest in this technology. We have to teach people how to use this. I've been advocating for this technology since I've been on city council, and I will continue to do so. Thank you so much. great question <clears throat> and we do that by making the city more attractive to businesses especially make it more attractive for remote work as we know technologies like artificial intelligence they're the way of the future that's work that can be done from home so we make Bangor more, more attractive we make we do that by improving our public transit make it more convenient uh, make it more accessible we also get creative with things like multi-use spaces for people who want to work remotely but don't necessarily want to work from, from home. Because um, one thing about Bangor is it's very good at reinventing itself. You know, we went from the Queen City of the East, and then the fire of 1911 happened, we became the city of homes. And then when the lumber industry started to wind down, we became the convention city. And then later on, we became a city known for shopping. So we can reinvent ourselves, and we will, but it, it takes the community to collaborate and work together. And we you can also do a lot of work building business here at home. We have a Bangor Innovation Center that incubates small businesses and works with local entrepreneurs. So we need to make better use of that and really make sure the city is aware this exists, that we have resources that if you've got, if you live in Bangor and you have a great idea for a business, contact the city. We want to know about it and we want to work with you and we want to use this innovation center to help you get off the ground. But I will say this, all of this will be for naught if we don't have a place to put people. We don't have homes. You know, and I believe that once again, maybe we should look at becoming the city of homes and build enough for everybody where everybody who wants to call Bangor home should have a home and it's safe and decent and affordable. Thank you.
So in order to strengthen uh, our downtown businesses and encourage more entrepreneurship, I think we can look to some of the things that we learned um, through the pandemic. Um, during the pandemic, uh, the city was able to become a little bit more flexible with their zoning variances and their codes and policies. Um, so business could kind of flex during this challenging time. Um, we got amazing parklets. We tried different things. We need to continue to um, encourage that kind of flexibility of the city uh, to allow businesses to try something different. Um, we need to, you know, there are great grants from EMDC and also through the city. Um, the city could support some more as well uh, so that struggling businesses or startups could diversify their revenue stream. Um, I'd like to see more mixed use development downtown um, because housing, like everyone has already said, is a huge issue. We need workforce housing, we need affordable housing. Um, and finally, I'd really like to see um, city support more hackathons and, you know, there was recently the big gig competition. You know, we need to have venues where people can test out their ideas in front of other people and see if it might work. And then we need to have investors ready to step in when it seems like maybe this is something we could try. Thanks. Thank you. So everyone got the answer to that question. And I'm sorry, folks, we're, we're going to go right to the uh, closing statements. And Mike, could you uh, start us off on this round? Well, again, I'd like to thank uh, Huston University and the League of Women Voters and the Downtown Bangor Partnership for this opportunity to to answer some questions and talk more about my campaign. The slogan for my campaign is, Change Starts Here. And the reason for that is actually because of an encounter I had with the owner and operator of Fresh Start, Scott Party. Uh, when I first started looking into a city issues was when we were deep in the decision paralysis of the ARPA uh, funding. And I started showing up to council and ask questions and bring information from the treasury about other way, communities who were using the funding for affordable housing. And at one of the meetings, Scott Party was there and told me about something called Fresh Start. And it was something I was not aware of. And so he told me about it. I said, this sounds really interesting. Now, I'm going to tell you that I come from a background where substance use and drug use, stigma is attached to that. And that was beat into me. So I'm like, oh boy, what am I going to see? You know, it's going to be a mess. And he started taking me to these, these houses and showing me. And these are the same houses I ride my bike by. I had no idea. And I got to meet the individuals there. And they are committed to recovery. And they are serious about recovery. And they show that people do recover. All you have to do is give them the resources and give them the chance. That inspired me. And when he said to me, you have to be the change you want to see, I said, you know, you're right. I'm going to run. And here I am. So I'm running to address a lot of issues like affordable housing, substance use disorder, and make sure that we have the resources, whether it's from the state level, the federal level, what we have, what we have to do at home. I want to collaborate with the community and make sure that we have an opportunity to address these issues. Because we'll never, ever address them if we don't regularly talk about them and don't regularly act. And that's the key is action, action, action. And that's what you'll get with me as a counselor. I, Hope to have your support on November 7th. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Morgan. Thank you. As a mother of two who has proudly called Bangor home for two decades and dedicated my career to public service, I firmly believe that we can build a bright future for Bangor. Growing up in Washington County, Bangor has always been a part of my life. This city isn't just a dot on a map, it's a dynamic heart that beats in the lives of countless others like me who have always looked to Bangor with a sense of promise and opportunity. Bangor's significance as a service center is undeniable, and I believe it's a role we should not only embrace, but also envision a future around. Bangor's importance transcends geographic boundaries. 
It's a hub of opportunity, a source of support, and a community that has woven itself into the fabric of lives across northern and eastern Maine. As we look ahead, it's crucial that we recognize and, and celebrate Bangor's role, not just as a service center, but as a leader in addressing the challenges that unite us. In this journey forward, we should remember that a compassionate and forward-thinking city should never turn its back on our most vulnerable neighbors. Instead, we should stand together, united in our commitment to finding innovative solutions that uplift and empower every member of our community. Bangor, with its rich history and its promise for a brighter future, should lead the way in creating a city that thrives on, on inclusivity, opportunity, and resilience. Let's work together to ensure that Bangor continues to shine as a beacon of hope, embracing its unique role in Maine with open arms and leading the way to a better future for all of us. My name is Morgan Pottle Urquhart, and I hope I can count on your vote on or before November 7th. It's been a real honor uh, to share the stage with all of you today. Um, I do not in any way imagine that I personally have all the answers of how to solve the challenges that Bangor faces. If these were easy fixes, then Bangor would have found a way to solve them already. But I have the energy to show up, the empathy to listen, and the honesty to tell the truth. I believe that there is nothing that we cannot do if we, when we work together, and I would be honored to be a member of the council as we explore evidence-based solutions. I want to see the city take some creative steps to increase transportation in the city and explore ways to not only make the city more walkable, bikeable, and accessible, but also reduce stigma and help people feel safe, as well as change the narrative of Bangor as a dangerous place. As a counselor, I will help the city to build back trust with their first responders by paying them fairly and supporting them to hire and retain the best candidates. I want to be a strong voice for all of you. I will use my privilege in this capacity as a city counselor to keep your stories and your lived experiences at the center of the discussion and as a lens through which I will make my decisions. I want everyone to feel the same pride about Bangor as I do. And as I have been knock, uh, walking around knocking on over 400 doors so far, nearly every person has told me how much they love living here. We have incredible neighborhoods, a thriving downtown, wonderful businesses, and amenities. We have a welcoming community that draws people from all over to set up here, right here in Bangor. I want to be on the City Council so that I can help Bangor realize the amazing plans that it has. I am a team player who can help build consensus so the Council can make real progress. I'm Kim Boucher, and I would be honored by your vote on or before Election Day, November 7th. Thank, Thank you. you. I've never wanted to live anywhere else than Bangor, Maine. We can all stand up here and share our dreams, our goals, and our hopes for Bangor with you, and they're all good. But I think I have the right, by virtue of age and experience, to give our, my fellow candidates this piece of advice. Give legs to your hopes and dreams. Don't let them die. And above all, once you settle into that council chair, don't ever become a potted plant or a rubber stamp. You serve nobody by doing that. Be yourself, use your intelligence, and fight for what you want. Bangor is much more than the waterfront concerts, or the Stephen King House, or the Chamber of Commerce annual dinner. 
its people. And what I've heard more than once tonight is work together. I wish you could have all been here in 1959 when we celebrated the 125th anniversary. I have never in my life seen a greater sense of community than we had that year. It was fabulous. And I want us to get that back. We don't need an anniversary to do it. We need to close the gaps between the various and many interest groups so that we're not working on separate agendas. We're working for one cause and one cause only, and that's to build a better, more beautiful Bangor. I thank the League of Women Voters for this opportunity, and I thank you for your attention. And if you vote for me, I'll thank you for that too. I'd like to thank um, the League of Women Voters for the opportunity to speak tonight and putting on this event. I'd like to thank Hassan University and the Downtown Partners Group for hosting this tonight and uh, having the opportunity to uh, meet the other candidates. I'm honored to be on the stage with you and have the opportunity. I love Bangor. Um, it's, it's been my home base, as I said, and it's, it's just part of my soul. I've always loved it. And um, I, I really, I have the passion to get on the board and work with the other council people. And, um, and first and foremost, um, the position is for Bangor. It would be a voice in the work and everything that I would do as a council person would be for the betterment of Bangor. That means all of the residents. Um, I think that Bangor has got a big heart. It's had a big heart and we've opened doors to a lot of people. And I think that things happened quickly in the last 10 years, and especially in the, with COVID, we've had a lot of changes. And I think we need to work together uh, through a collaborative passion for the future of Bangor and bring Bangor back. Bring Bangor back to all the things we've loved in the past and continue to look forward to new things to, for our, um, our next generations to be able to continue to thrive, live and love Bangor like we have. Thank you very much. I think in conclusion, I've, I've been thinking, why are we here in Bangor? I have to say that I didn't choose to be in Bangor. When I was in eighth grade, my father accepted a position running Vina Brothers Shoes, and we moved to Bangor from the suburbs of Boston. So it was a bit different for me. He had two choices. He could go to Sturbridge Village, Wisconsin, or Bangor, Maine. And I thank God that he chose Bangor, Maine. I have absolutely loved growing up here. I am the only member of my family that has remained here. I married a Bangor boy. My son was born here, and I am so proud to call Bangor my home. I have many points that I'd like to make tonight, but I don't think time allows. So what I'd like to just say in conclusion is when I decided to run for city council, I thought, what are the issues that I sit at home with my husband and speak about every night? They're the same things that you're all talking about. Combating homelessness. Everyone here knows we have a problem with homelessness. Keeping our streets and our parks and our neighborhoods safe. I have a passion for improving our roads and sidewalks. I'm an avid dog walker, and I have tripped over countless potholes. Continued excellence in our Bangor school system is extremely important to me. I volunteered throughout my son's career in school, in the school systems. The teachers are a very important part of our children's upbringing. Keeping downtown vital, encouraging economic growth, and creating more opportunities to keep our young people here. So many of them leave after high school, after graduating from trade school and college. We need to create more jobs here to keep our young people in Bangor. I hope that you will vote for me on or before November 7th 
and I hope that you all encourage your friends and your family to vote as well. This is a very important election. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Nice to meet everyone. Um, I just remember as a Canadian, we'd come down for fall Christmas shopping or clothes shopping for the school year. We'd come to the Bangor Mall and shop, and then we'd go back to St. John. I'd think, well, geez, that's a kind of a cool little city, but I never thought I'd be sitting here at this beautiful Hudson Theater talking about running for city council of Bangor, Maine. But here I am, and, um, you know, I, I guess uh, what I would say is you know, as an engineer, I have this logical brain, so I'm like, I'm more data driven. So um, I, I feel like every time in my life I've made decisions based out of my emotion or my feeling, it's typically led me in the wrong direction. Um, you could ask my wife, she's up in the top row there. But um, so I, I'm just, I'm very fact based. So um, if we're gonna spend money going down a path, I, I want data, I want facts. If, there's, if it's been tried and attempted in a different uh, city, let's find out. Let's, why do we have to try and recreate a wheel every time? Let's find data, let's support that. And if you're looking for someone like that to, uh, to be on the city council, then, then, uh, then vote for me before November 7th. I, I envision um, infrastructure to support uh, this, this incredible city that we live in, bike trails and walking trails with lighting that connects the downtown waterfront up through the Kanduskeg and over across into Brewer and what Brewer has done. It's, it's like this beautiful start to something that we could expand upon um, and just have additional beautification of this, um, of this amazing city. And then leveraging the proximity of Umaine and, and Hassan to think about like some of the materials engineering work that they're doing, some of the biotech work that they're doing, and to think that we could leverage that to start to bring um, high paying jobs into this region to support uh, the growth that, uh, that, that we want and that we envision for our community. So uh, with that, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, f first I wanted to just start off just thanking the League of Women Voters, Huston University, and the Downtown Bangor Partnership for organizing this. I, I know it's a lot of work to do that. I, I'm, I'm looking at you. <laughs> um, no, th th thank you so much for it from the bottom of my heart. I, I, I love that we're having a in-person uh, forum like this. It's really, really, I think, helpful to uh, humanize this process. Um, I also want to thank every single one of the candidates here um, for, for choosing to run for Bangor. Uh, trust me that this is the fourth time I've done this in the last four years and this is not an easy task to take on. So thank you so much for doing what you've done. Um, and lastly, I, I, I wanna thank everyone here, uh, the, the, the voters for taking the time out of your day to be here with us and listen to what all these leaders and myself have to say about Bangor. I know there are a lot of big problems Bangor faces, like affordable housing and homelessness. Um, and a lot of those problems are also national problems too that are affecting every single municipality across America. And all of those leaders across this great country, whether they're Republican, Democrat, Independent, Green, Libertarian, it doesn't matter. They are all trying to solve the same problems we are trying to solve right here in our little piece of this country. As we go forward, we must study what our sister cities are doing to solve these issues. We have to mimic what is successful and avoid strategies that are not successful. And that is something I will do. This job is a lot of work. It is very stressful. Um, there are seemingly no breaks, uh, especially if you're like me and you publicly uh, declare your personal cell phone number, 207-299-5282. Um, but I will say this. Um, you know, as, har as hard and as thankless as this job can be at times, I, you know, I, I wouldn't be anywhere else right now. My name is Joseph Leonard, and I'll be knocking on a door near you soon. Thank you. All candidates got to give their closing statements. Please applaud these people that are doing a wonderful thing by running for city council. Thank you very much.
I'm so glad I live in a city where people really do care and they uh, do get out and vote. Maine has the highest uh, voting rate of any state in the nation and Bangor is right up there. Please get out and vote uh, before or on November 7th. Uh, it's easy to do. Uh, find out all you can. Share with your friends that uh, they can see the candidates' forms from tonight uh, and also the two issues forms that were earlier this week. Um, thank you. Thank you for being Bengal.